Welcome to The Game Maker's Notebook, a podcast featuring a series of in-depth one-on-one conversations between game makers providing a thoughtful, intimate perspective on the business and craft of interactive entertainment. The Game Maker's Notebook is presented by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, a member-driven organization dedicated to the recognition and advancement of interactive entertainment. Hello, and welcome to The Game Maker's Notebook. I'm your host, Robin Hunnicky, and I'm so thrilled to be here today with one of my favorite folks, Derek Yu, creator of Spelunky and Spelunky 2. And we're here today to talk a little bit about all kinds of stuff just to catch up, kind of pretend like we're at a conference and that we just bumped into each other in the hallway and are having a little chat. So, Derek, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. It's so nice to see you again virtually through this screen of recording audios. (laughs) Yeah, no, totally. I think this is a great um, substitute for the moment for (laughs) going to events and getting to chat with other game developers. So I'm very excited. It's so great to have you here. Well, you know, before we before we do the catch up, catch up, let's actually give the audience a little bit of background on you in case they don't already know you and your fantastic games. Tell me a little bit about how you got started in the industry and where you come from. Sure. Yeah. Um, You know, I've just been excited about video games from a very young age. Uh, my parents had like an Atari 2600 sitting around when I was when I was born. Um, Sweet. And so, yeah, I I started just designing games on paper. Um, I have a very good friend, John Perry, who I was fortunate enough to meet in second grade. And we had a little group of friends that just loved video games. But, you know, John is one of those people who, like me, was also interested in the creative aspect. And so we would just draw and design our own games on paper. Um, And then, you know, I think probably the next big milestone for me was when I found out about Click and Play, which was a game making tool. You know, it's kind of like a uh, precursor to stuff like Game Maker and Unity that people use today. I was around 12 when it came out. I was very excited. And I think it was with Click and Play that like, you know, game making really clicked like beyond just designing on paper but this was a tool where when i used it it felt very natural to make games this way and i kind of dabbled a little bit about like what that was like like what 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 part of it felt natural you know to me like i um you know even before like designing video games and getting into video games i just love drawing um and uh you know like i'm a very visual person and I think there was something about click and play that just felt very organic, like drawing in the sense that, you know, when I had ideas about games through click and play, I could kind of just make them appear yeah, instantly, you know, I think that that visual interface and the ability to kind of drag and drop things onto a scene, it, it felt like a more direct connection to my brain and my ideas, just like drawing how like if I had an idea for you know, like a monster or something that I wanted to draw, I can just like pull my pen out and just make it start appearing like instantly. Um, And I think that was very important for me. Like I do enjoy programming, but I think just sort of like sitting there in front of code only, it just doesn't interface with my brain in the same way, you know? So that was like a really big turning point for me. I totally understand that. My actual, my first experiences programming were actually in Supercard and Hypercard, like and so it was a similar thing. Like I had to build a Turing machine in HyperCard for my first programming class in college. And it was so cool to be able to like make a physical tape of zeros and ones and then watch it pop in and out of the reader and think about how computers work. Thinking about it as like as if you were like kind of zooming inside the computer and seeing it operate with bits, you know, right there in your in your screen. And then, yeah, you make a button, you press the button it changes the page or you make a button that says animate and then you press it and it animates a character and just felt really like physical, I guess, maybe in a way that, or visual, I guess, is like, as you're saying, in a way that programming didn't. Yeah, for sure. No, like physical, I think is, is a good way of, of talking about it. And I'm like, you know, very excited for stuff like visual, uh, visual for, for like virtual reality to, um, you know, to be, get used more and more in game development itself. Uh, because yeah, I think it's, it's a part of drawing. I think that actually doesn't get talked about enough, like learning how to draw. There's, 
you know, for me, there's like an actual physical pleasure to pushing the yeah. pen on the paper and kind of feeling it like interact with the pen. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't get that as much with my tablet, even though I use it more to do art these days. And I still really enjoy just, just drawing on like actual paper because of that sensation. And I think it does, it, you know, like I, I think I, I tend to draw like even a little differently just because of that physical aspect of it. Oh, totally. Have you ever done the thing where you try to put like tracing paper on top of the tablet to get that paper feel or like, Oh my gosh, I haven't, but I might try that now. I never even thought about that. It kind of works. Like I am also really, really physically sensitive to the way the pen goes across a paper or I like to do watercolors. And I find that like I have a tablet, I have like the huge um, tablet. I have a, I have a Microsoft surface that I'm actually using to record this right now, which has a huge touchscreen and a pen, but I just do not like doing watercolor fills or even using digital brushes. Um, I have behind me in my studio a huge <laughs> table covered with watercolors and brushes and watercolor papers and different kinds because I find the act of doing physical watercolors so much more engaging than doing it digitally. And I know I could do a lot more if I was really interested in like working with Procreate and getting really good at it, but it doesn't feel as good to me. I, I got ruined by doing it the old way, I guess. No, it makes a big difference. Um... And, you know, with like painting, I like I've done a little bit of, you know, just oil painting and stuff like that. And there's like a technique that I learned where, you know, you actually hold the brush further down, uh, you know, toward the end of the brush, like the opposite end to actually like force yourself to lose control of the brush a little bit. Yeah, to get a little sloppy. Yeah, get a little sloppy. And I, I think... When I'm when I'm painting with the tablet, I just I find myself to be more of like a tight painter versus like <laughs> yeah. you get like kind of neener neenery because you can undo stuff. Like yeah, the yeah, first yeah, time totally. you do I'm just stuff. like I feel like I'm gripping the pen like a little harder. Hard. And I, yeah, it's you know, and I think it I think it also speaks to like user interfaces in games like you know Mario Maker. How you know when you place like a block. Like there's a little wiggle to it and it makes a sound. And there's this game, there's this indie game. It's kind of more of a toy called Townscaper. I don't know if you've heard of it. No, I but haven't. It, it lets you, it just lets you build little towns um, on water. It's like, it, it just starts like, there's just like an endless kind of ocean. And then you can just start placing little town pieces. And the town pieces very organically kind of fit together as you kind of plop them down. Um, that just sounds and there's really nice. <laughs> just like a very tactile sensation to the placing of the pieces where like they go like bloop and you know it feels like you're dropping something into water and then That's like cool. little birds and parks and stuff like that will sort of randomly fill in depending on the arrangement of the town pieces and uh yeah it's 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 actually it's it looks like it's quite popular which is cool but I think that you know like I don't think it would be as cool as it is if it didn't have those little tactile kind of effects, you know, when, whenever you made a change to it. So, you know, it's funny because like, so, so when I talk to people that uh, like say some of my students and I say, hey, you know, like I think this needs a little more pepper or it needs a little more juice. Sometimes they're like, what do you mean? And I think what I'm really often saying is like, you need to add the secondary and tertiary feedback to the system so that when I do something, it feels more tactile and more physical. But it's even just like exhausting to have to say that over and over. So you create these shortcuts like juicy or like, you know, good game feel or whatever. But it really does come down to that kind of the physical feedback of the of the system itself. Have you ever watched a kid like do digital coloring on an iPad? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I've seen my daughter do it all the time. Yeah, it's like, you know, they take their little fat finger and they're like, dip it in the color and then dip it in the area. And it's like, I watched my nephew at one point trying to color in something and he couldn't get his fat little finger inside the lines of the shape he wanted to color. So he kept like double and triple tapping on the color and then double and triple tapping on the, on the shape. And I was like, dude, like, there's a whole generation of kids that are going to learn to color by like, just like vigorously, like essentially jamming the crayon into the paper. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. The metaphor is so strange, 
but like it's such a it's such a different metaphor for coloring than heating up a wax crayon to the point that it spreads more thinly over the surface of a piece of paper you know it may be yeah, a little bad, yeah. to be honest yeah no and uh yeah and so i guess yeah that that physical i think feeling of of making a game was yeah it was it was important to me i think um coming to game development at, from more of a visual standpoint um what was the first thing you made in 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 this program do you remember I the first game I finished, which I don't think ever made it online, was called Sasquatch Fight, <laughs> and it was kind of like it was kind of like a Smash style two player fighting game where each player controls a Sasquatch, and you're just trying to push them into the water, like there are all these little platforms and you try to push them into the water. The first like game that I actually released was just. It was a it was another two player game, uh, where you're just fighting each other with little soldiers, and it was called Trigger Happy, and I I put that on AOL, and I just I remember getting like my first feedback about the game and people saying like Hey, this was fun. Are you gonna you know make That's anything cool. else? Are you gonna make changes to it? And yeah, I kind of point to that moment as the the moment when I like really got hooked on the whole. <laughs> making releasing games interacting with other people through the games yeah. yeah yeah that's so cool i was trying to describe to someone today um they were asking me about roblox and like how do you get people to notice your game on roblox and we we're talking about well you can you know you can buy ads and stuff but really it's kind of like going back to the time when it was just like a forum or whatever and people just release lots of stuff in there and then it kind of gets viral because people like it and then they tell their friends about it. And the next thing you know, there's a ton of people giving you feedback about your game. I think that people have really kind of missed out on that loop, you know, as games have become more commercial and like sort of some of the flash stuff has kind of faded away. There's like, it's exciting to see it kind of reemerging inside of a new tool. But at the same time, if you're making a game in Roblox, you're kind of using a pretty intense editor. So you do have to like, really abstract yourself from the concepts and think a little bit harder about like, what am I really building in the moment? It's not um, as close to pastiche programming, which is kind of the the visual programming style that Scratch and and other kinds of visual programming language type environments use. Did you, did you think of yourself as a programmer when you were making games or did you think of yourself as a game maker? I thought of myself as a game maker because with click and play, with click and play, there actually wasn't really any programming in terms of like typing in code. They had this very unique uh, checkbox system where you could kind of set up like different events, but ultimately all you were doing were like checking these different boxes. But you could get like pretty complicated with it somehow. Um, to be honest, it wasn't super intuitive. <laughs> uh, and you know, I think over the over the years, like people took took click and play or like the follow ups to click and play, and they added like Lua scripting and stuff to it. But um, I think just getting getting control of like the entire game, where you're like doing the sprites, you're doing the the coding, even though it's check boxes and and whatever else. I think just it was more like having that kind of control made me feel. Like a like a game maker, like I was in control of the entire game, and Click and Play actually had its own its own bustling little community around it in the early days of online, and it was kind of interesting. There was a um, there was like a like a like a middle aged woman, a mom, I think, who ran like one of the biggest Click and Play message boards at the time. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, no, it was neat, and you know, because. Uh, yeah, she she just kind of like hosted this forum for for the whole community. It was called the Wall, um, and I'm blanking on her name, but it was it was neat. And we would meet up and 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 talk, and it was like its own it was like its own little microcosm of of the current indie game community, um, where we would just we'd release games mostly to each other. We'd yeah. advertise our games to each other. You know, we'd have little arguments. People would like, <laughs> you know, there'd be drama because like, oh, so and so's studio quote unquote 
just like snatched up an, an artist from like another person's quote unquote studio, <laughs> you know, uh, and it, we're just releasing games for fun for free. But like, you know, it took it very seriously, I think, as uh, almost like a bunch of kids kind of like playing pretend business, you know? Yeah. I think actually that, that you see that in in Roblox a little bit now, if you hang out and watch kind of how things are going there. So Roblox it, is its own game, right? And But you can like make your own games within it? Is that it, how it works? It, it's, a, it's a feed of games, not unlike Congregate was, um, and then a tool set, and then you can make your own stuff for it. So it's... It's a, it's a, it's basically a, a collection of games that have been made using the tool, and you can either just hang out and play the games, or you can go and make your own. It's a, a lot more advanced. The tool is a lot more advanced than than something like yeah, like you know, Scratch or or um, or Click and Play or HyperCard. But it it is less intense than something as advanced as Unity or Unreal. So you can make your own games in it, and then you can share them and. A lot of the games that are there that are really popular have been made by people that are like sub 20, you know, they're just like hanging out in there and like 14, 15, 16, they start making games and then their games go viral and then they just have exactly what you're talking about. They just have a bunch of people talking about their games, they're playing their games and their games are actually making money, which is kind of awesome if you think about it. Oh, you can actually sell your games on Roblox, huh? Oh, totally. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that's so great. some, Some Roblox creators are millionaires, man. Wow. Yeah. And they're like 12 years old. <laughs> well, I think those ones tend to be a little bit closer to 18, but some of them are not yet 18. Yes. There are some very successful people in Roblox that are gotcha. quite young. Yeah. And they're so, all really cool. <laughs> is Roblox inspired by some like a physical real world toy? Because it the name just sounds like something like Lego or something from my childhood, I feel like. Yeah. I mean, I think Dave, Mr. Builderman, the, the creator of Roblox was like really interested in the idea of creating a metaverse where kids could be educated and hang out with each other and learn how to code. And he just started making a blocks based system. You know, this idea of like, you know, these, like, they look kind of like little, like, yeah, like little Lego people. And there's just a system that you can use to code up games and hang out in it. And I mean, the first time I saw Roblox, I was visiting some friends of my aunt's um, in the desert. And it was two kids that are like living out in the middle of the desert, Sonoran desert. And they had like old, I think it was old Kindles or really old iPads and they were playing Roblox on it and they were just like, do you want to see my Roblox? Do you play Roblox? Can I show you my Roblox? Yeah, yeah, do you, do you, do you, do you want to see it? And it was like the game that they were playing was just, it was kind of like a zombie shooter in a subway station and there were just like a zillion kids running around trying not to get touched by zombies. It was awesome. That is so cool. No, I'm <laughs> so glad so because that, that reminds me so much of the click and play community and Click and play was honestly like so just formative. And I learned so much there that, you know, so many skills that I ended up using when I became like a professional game developer. So I'm, I'm really glad that that kind of play still exists for, for young people, especially. Because yeah, it's like, cool. You can copy any game that's made that has a, the public copy turned on and copy it and mod it. So that's the other thing is like you can find something you like and then you can open it up in the editor and, and, and then dupe it. Um, which is cool because then you can do whatever you want in that space. And so you don't even really need to know everything about how a game works to just start to play with it and take it apart. Right, right. Yeah, no, that's really that's really key because I think just getting started can be very overwhelming and frustrating for sure. Oh, especially I mean, Click and Play had, similar, had a similar thing where, you know, they had built-in games um, and, you, yeah, you could, you could just take them apart and, and learn from them too, which was great. They're, yeah, so they're that's like built what in. They're like main. Their main game was this game called Romeo and the Pie Devil. <laughs> it's just so ridiculous. It's like, yeah, you 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 played Romeo from Romeo and Juliet, and the antagonist was the Pie Devil, who was just this little demon who threw pies or something. <laughs> What's cool about that is it didn't take itself too seriously. Like it was just like. Do you know anything about the people that made it? Um, I know they're just French software engineers, and the, you know, Click and Play still exists as Multimedia Fusion, which I, I know people still use to make even commercial games. That's cool. So they're still around, yeah. 
It's like when people sort of joke around about artisanal or like heirloom, you could sort of say click and play games are like heirloom or artisanal games because they come from this really old, old background. What, when you were when you were doing like your click and play stuff, is that do you think it had like an influence on sort of your later participation in things like TIG Source and stuff like that? Like, were you trying to kind of create that environment again for yourself as an older person? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think, you know, just in general, like around the click and play time, I started going online and just became like very online and, and making my own <laughs> web pages, just like very much wanting to participate in this in this new thing. And also just, you know, to find other people who are interested in the same thing. I think that was so cool to just be able to turn on the computer and then just meet like a bunch of people, a lot of them around my age, around the world who are all interested in the same thing. Because, you know, I was lucky to have met my friend John Perry in second grade who yeah. not only wanted to play games, but wanted to make them, right? Like, that's a, it's like a you know a very big distinction because we had this group of friends that that all loved playing games, but it was only really John that was like really interested in making them in the same way, and so to go online and just like find communities of all people like that you know was like really really exciting. Yeah, and so I'm, I was just like drawn to those kinds of communities, whether it was game making or you know there was like an art community when I was in um when I was in college called Eat Poo, which was like <laughs> really also just like a really important community for me during that time. Um, because it can, you know, it can just be hard to meet people who have that same kind of interest as you, you know, in, in like, like face to face when you, when you're not really going to like conventions and stuff. Right. Yeah. And so totally. I think I was just like really just yearning to meet other people like that. I was actually sort of describing to these kids, asking me about Roblox, you know, how do you get viral? I was telling them like, you know, back in the day when I was a child, um, you would buy records to have music in your house and you would go to the, you go to two places. You could either go to the mall and buy records that were being played on the radio, or you could go to a music store, like a record store in some strip mall somewhere that was like, an independent record store and it would have records that you would never have heard. And I ended up just being really excited about records that no one that I knew knew about. And I would go to the record store like literally every weekend and I would save all my lunch money so that I could buy one record a week. Like a record was like $10.99 or $12.99. And so I'd save all my lunch dollars. I'd eat I'd eat lunch, like minimal lunch as possible so that I could save my money and then buy records. And the only way you could figure out what records to buy was by basically looking at record covers and then asking the guy behind the counter if he'd play it for you and asking him if he thought it was cool. And you have to like figure out which of the people at the record store like the same kind of records as you and then bug them. Yeah, I, I do miss <laughs> that like stalking sensation. Like, yeah. It's weird. Just right? not knowing like what you got at all. Like, yeah. Yeah. That's something that is, uh, that's a fe feeling that I feel like is going to be hard to bring back. But the thing is, is when you're playing Roblox games and you're trolling around in Roblox or like if you're going through congregate games, you know, it was kind of the same thing. You would like, oh, this seems all right. Seems like people are playing it. I'll give them a shot. Or your friend would be like, send you a link and then you open it up and you poke at it. And it, so it, it that's is actually, cool. that is cool. And, you know, it, it makes me think that, you know, one of the things that, like one of the things that was important to me when I was working on TIG Source was just highlighting like hidden gem games, right? Um, and then, you know, it seemed like there was a point where like everyone was starting to cover indie games. And I thought, you know, maybe there isn't really like a need for for TIG source anymore, like just mainstream websites are covering indie games now. But now there are like so many indie games. Um, and I feel like I'm thinking once again about how to how to highlight small games again. And I think part of it yeah. is also it's not even just that there's so many games, but the way we acquire games, it's I feel like it's still not easy enough to like 
find a small game and then just start playing it right away. And I think one of the great things it sounds like about Roblox is that you're like right there. You're like already, you're basically already like in the game. You just need to like point at it and then you can just start playing it, right? Like all these little games are are in a bigger game. And so they're just ready to be played immediately. And I think that that immediacy is like, super important for small games and you know i was kind of hoping that like streaming would be a really great avenue for small games yeah because i think that you know i think it's really important for small games to just like be able to access them like really easily and honestly if if you can pay like some kind of subscription or something and then just like play a bunch of small games and try them out. Um, I just, I think that'd be cool, but you know, I'm really, I'm, I'm kind of getting the feeling that sort of, you know, what people are, are, are looking for, at least the, you know, people who are designing like these big streaming services is that they're looking for like big games. Yeah. I mean, I think that it, it really depends on the, the revenue model that the, the service is trying to provide. So Roblox is basically like you go to the Roblox website. There's exactly as you described, there's a ton of links to different games. There's also a store where you can buy stuff for your avatar. You can buy Robux, which you can spend in their, in their ecosystem but you click on the link and then it says, would you like to open up the Roblox app? And you say, sure. And then it just opens it up on your computer and then you're in that game and you can play it and run around. Um, You can buy stuff sometimes in the game if you want to. You can spend your Robux in the game. You can hang out with people. If you're a certain age, you can chat. If you're not, then, you know, chat is disabled and there's like different safety levels and stuff. But like I have my, the, the, the head of ops and culture at my studio, Jason Haber, he's got two kids one is 10 and the other is six. And they're both in Roblox all the time now. And the one plays it like a social game where she's like interacting with all of her friends and like they're building stuff together and talking about it. And the other one is just like, I want to go do this obby. And they just basically, which is an obstacle course. It's basically like a platformer. He just runs around with his dad in these environments. And, you know, of course, obviously my GM is like, he's he's going a little bit nuts playing all these low end, you know, obstacle courses and stuff, but he's become fascinated with it. And so now we're fascinated with it as a studio. We're actually kind of building some stuff in Roblox right now just to see what it's like um, and to hang out in that space. And it's it's actually, I find it really fascinating and fun. It, wow, well, I, I think you I think you just infected me with the uh you gotta come and play Roblox fascination too. It's pretty great. <laughs> you should totally come. I'll show I'll I'll share you our link and you can come and hang out in our in our thing. Okay, um, cool. Yeah, no, I, I I I'd heard about it obviously, but I just I didn't realize like ex- I just didn't understand exactly what what it was. But it, it sounds great. It sounds like it's actually doing a lot of the things that I was I was hoping to to see get done. I think so. And I actually think that what's cool about it is that memes get generated inside of it by the players and then those become games or memes and other games. And so there's like a sort of a synergy where over time it evolves into its own little shard of reality. And if you spend a lot of time in there, you know, and you grow up in there, which a lot of kids do, then you have all access to all this kind of culture that is completely separate from adult culture and completely separate from adult games, you know, adult in the sense of, you know, it's the last of us or whatever, you know, right? where it's like, you know, you have adults who have been playing the last of us, you know, for seven years or whatever, you know, they've been waiting for the new one for four years, you know, and there's this really long time frame of, of fandom, whereas, whereas in Roblox or, or, you know, sort of the Minecraft server space, right? It's completely different. It's just like, it literally could be a week or two weeks and you would get an iteration on something that you could hang out in and hang out with your friends in and like, you know, and judge and talk about and experience and then move on from. Um, it's such a different way of interacting with content than say, you know, playing Fortnite every night with your three friends, you know, like, which is, it's just a different way of engaging, um, which really does, I think, mirror Congregate or Tig Source or some of these other services that were about showing off Flash games or showing off, you know, web-based gaming where it was really about the community of, of practice, which is kind of cool, you know? It's No, it's it sounds extremely thing. futuristic. And I, of course, it would be kids that are kind of leading the way on this. I mean, just <laughs> having this like self-contained, extremely immersive world where you can, you can just 
build your own games and obstacle courses and, and socialize and whatever else. I mean, that is totally the future of games in a nutshell, I think. <laughs> The other thing that's really interesting to me about it is that it it eschews all conventions around controls, UI, like keyboard layouts, everything is, it's completely DIY. So if you think about it, it's kind of the most punk rock way to play video games because it's really deconstructed and a lot of it is very raw. And so there's this quality of like um, independence, fierce independence and like childness in it which I think is really fascinating and cool. Um, I hate to say it, but I feel like a lot of content, you know, quote unquote content, even using the word content feels dirty these days. It's like a lot of it is very processed and like made for, you know, kids by adults. And it's nice to be in a place where they're just like playing. It like feels a lot more like being in the woods and coming across someone's cool fort, you know? where you're like, you can't really imagine what they were imagining, but you get the vibe, you know, like, oh, it has a cool cubby hole and there's like a rope and like they took these busted chairs and put them over here and there's like a weird paper crown or whatever. And you can kind of imagine playing in it. I think, I think a lot of what I like about what I see in, in, in the content in Roblox is that it has that quality. If Does that make sense? Yeah, no, totally. I think I think children I think children and just, you know, amateurs in in general hobbyists tend to come up with ideas that are just way more exciting in a lot of ways. Um, you know, they lack polish, but the the seed, you know, that you kind of want to start with, I think you sort of want that rawness to it. Um before, you know, before you you maybe start start polishing it as like a you know professional creator or whatever but it's uh i think it's i think it's really important to to try not to lose that that feeling and sensation um i think of of being a kid or just just being a hobbyist i mean i, I think that's something that i really try to carry with me into, into my projects is it is that feeling of you know being in the click and play community you know and uh and just kind of coming up with ideas like off the cuff and just being very sort of like connected emotionally to the idea, um, which I think it, it can be hard with just social media as your guide to, to try to figure out like what to work on and stuff because there's just so much data and there's just so much you know, you see so much more of the like commercialization of games on social media. Like when, you know, when everyone you're following on, on Twitter is like a professional game developer, like a professional artist or something like that. Um, so yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it can be kind I, of intimidating actually, I think. I mean, I, I think that one of the things about it is that like you can get really stuck like comparing yourself to, I mean, to you, you know, like imagine like you're some kid that's like really into Spelunky and then you're just like, oh, I'll never be able to build something that great. Like it's so complex and it has so many systems and it's so, I mean, it's endless, right? You can play it forever and it's hard to get good at and it's so well balanced. And like, I think there's a way in which you can just like, yeah, without getting to see the raw materials that led to it, it could be really, really kind of discouraging in a way. Yeah, for sure. And I think that was really cool was in, you know, in the click and play community, we were really just, I mean, we were obviously all playing like professional games and were inspired by, you know, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis or whatever we we're playing at the time. But yeah. like, we really only were comparing ourselves to each other, you know, in that little community. And we did, we were pushing each other to do better and better. But it, I think being in that community did make like we felt like real game developers, you know, and yeah, and I think that was really just important for our for our confidence as creators. And you know, we would like advertise our games, and we'd be like really serious about it. Be like, yeah, coming this coming this summer is going to be the sequel <laughs> to like this janky little game that I worked on. That you know, <laughs> and we were like super excited about that. Like we do, High like, Devil you know, Four. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> You know, the the seventh iteration of this game where you play like a bouncing ball and it's like, when we marketed it, like it was, uh, 
yeah, the next the the next big thing. And it was in our community, which was so cool. I think having yeah. these little microcosms is is awesome for for it's, anybody really, but especially for kids. Yeah, it feels kind of like being in a play in school, you know, like you're an actor, sure, but you're in a school play, right? Like, you know, you're in your sixth grade play. Like I remember being a flower in some play about a giant and I'm just obsessing over the the dance moves for this song we were going to do about being shrinking violets or whatever it was. I don't even remember. And just like obsessed with the costume and like really worrying about my like three minutes you know, in the, in the play, which it really was very empowering, but also like it was such a, it was like a little sort of a sample of what it would really be like. Like you said, playing at being a game developer versus really having to take on all those all those responsibilities and stuff. It's funny. I was um, I was sort of talking today with some people through Slack, um, which I think of now as talking to people, which is a sc- scary thought. But um, <laughs> I was yeah. reading a thread on my phone in Slack. Um, some developers were talking about like game pricing, and there was just just this really long, intense discussion between like maybe four or five people about what you should price a game at, you know? And I, I hadn't really been in a long discussion like that about anything really in a long time. And I realized that like, it was giving me those vibes of like being slightly drunk at a bar at a conference or being on a forum with a bunch of people where people are just firing back and forth. Like, you know, these arguments about the finer points of game pricing, um, and it was it was interesting because I was thinking both a this is really cool because I like to watch people fight about stuff I care about, but b also it's like a lot of pressure to to think about how much your game should cost right now, and it's it's a lot of work to come up with a a logic even that makes sense given I think exactly what you're talking about. There's just so much out there, and like so much to compare yourself to. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, pricing is something that. I've thought a lot about, and I think, you know, I think as for indie game developers, it just, it, it feels weird because, you know, you, you spend like years on something and then at the end you're, you're trying to decide between, should I charge, you know, should I be charging 15 or $20 for this, right? (laughs) Yeah. It's like, I just spent, you know, like four years on this and I'm, I'm, I'm really racking my brain about you know whether people are going to you know pay twenty dollars for it, um, and you know I think that the thing is it's like yeah the um, you know we're not selling like paintings it's not like a single object that you're just like yeah. charging for, um, and so. Yeah, I don't know. I, I I think as far as figuring out what to price, you, you are kind of like beholden to just like the actual sort of immutable market forces or whatever, um, which I think can be, you know, I think it's I think it 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 can be kind of painful when you know you spent four four years like making art and then having to to kind of like make decisions based on that, but just like from a realistic standpoint like you yeah, have Yeah, like you got to right? get paid for the work you put in. Yeah, exactly. And I so I think it's helpful to think about the fact that yeah, you are not you're not selling a painting, you're not selling like a sculpture. Yeah. It's a it's a digital game. And you know, the hope is that is that a lot of people are going to buy it. Um and you know, I think how many people you think are going to buy your game is is one of the factors that you think about in terms of in terms of pricing. You know, like if you feel like your game has has the opportunity to perhaps like make it into the mainstream consciousness and get like a mainstream audience, you know, it might make more sense for you to charge a lower price so that you have a better chance of kind of like breaking into that audience. Um yeah, but if you, you know, do one, that and then you don't sell enough units, then you're just like, oh, all those five dollars is that I didn't get. <laughs> it's a risk. Yeah, it, it's definitely a risk, um, and it's it's very difficult because you have to kind of like assess sort of the 
the mainstreamness of the game that you're working on, right? Which is like this very, this very fuzzy and hard to figure out uh, quantity, you know? Um, and I think there are other factors that, that go in, into play with that, you know, just like, I think it depends on if this is your first, second or third game and whether you have sort of made it into that place where, you know, you will get kind of coverage just because this is your second game and people know about your first game too, right? Yeah. Like all that kind of plays into sort of your, how big an audience you can, you can kind of expect. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think, um, I've always, yeah, I've always just felt like if, if you, if you feel like you can reach that, that bigger audience, I think, you know, in this day and age, it, it makes more sense to price a little lower. If you feel like you've got like a strong, a strong niche, you know, it might make sense to, to charge a little higher. And then, you know, it also depends a lot on just, you know, like what players like value in terms of money. You know, like yeah, I think, like how much time are they spending? Like yeah, how does it like fit that. in a category? Like if it's Ar- like a art category styles, that- even yeah, art styles I think are really important, and it's it's tough because I think there are there are things that that players do value, but they're not willing to pay for. You know, what would be an example of that? Do you think? I mean, I you know I'm working on UFO fifty right now, which is a uh, which is like a a it's a collection of 50 retro games. Um, and I just feel like, I just feel like a lot of people love pixel art. Yeah. Um, but I don't know that it's necessarily something that people are willing to pay like a premium price for, you know? Yeah. It's like, if you say, Oh, I released a chip tune album. People are like, okay, cool. It should cost $3. <laughs> yeah. People, and you know, there's thing. it's like people, people love them. I mean, even just like, I think just like being, being kind of like in the indie category, right? Like you're, you're already, your price point is already kind of much more limited than, than like a triple A game. There are just like certain labels and, and things that, that I think there are actually really large audiences for and th- that which, you know, people value a lot, but um, they may not see it as like something that they should be paying extra for. And so those are also, you know, I think things that you have to take into consideration. Um, it's interesting. I went in, I recently went to a talk in um, Collins Museum of Other Realities by an artist who'd created a bunch of essentially sculptures or toys in VR and then had been uh, creating like a blockchain type system so that they could be uniquely owned and identified. And then just was talking about the ecosystem of exchange that began to evolve around these virtual reality sculptures that he was selling. And some of them got really pricey. And I was like, wow, that's such a cool thing that people care enough to own a unique object and to have it even in a platform that is really not that popular right now and compared to say mobile games or you know web-based games, which are like huge. Um, and then I started thinking about the difference between a real thing and a copy and like, yeah, if you work really hard on something for four years, but anybody can own it, it's less exciting for some people, you know? But then for some people, because everyone can have it and you can talk about it to other people, then that's a reason that they value it. It's just markets are just really hard to really rationalize or think through once you really start asking yourself, like, why do people do what they do? Like, a lot of it doesn't really make a lot of sense. (laughs) Yeah, it's very, it's actually very emotionally driven. I mean, maybe that's not surprising at all. But, you know, like, I think another, another thing to think about with, with pricing is also just, um, you know, like, ultimately, like, what makes the news is, is not how much money uh, a game makes, but how many players it it has. And so, yeah. you know, I think there's, there is pressure there to just like get your, get like player counts up, you know, and, and also just to spread word of mouth, because I think these days with social media, people very much want to play the games that everyone else is talking about. And so you need to get people like talking about the game. And, you know, I think honestly, like, making the price making the price of your game 
lower is is a way to get more people to play. Um, Until everybody does it. And then it just becomes like you're in this category of games and you're like in the bottom third of it, let's say, in terms of pricing. And then it's like you don't signal luxury. That was actually one of the, the one of the bit finer points in this discussion was like, well, like jewelry is a good example, right? Like most jewelry is charging a massive markup because people buy jewelry to think about how expensive it is and to feel like they bought something expensive. It's not a value proposition. You don't buy jewelry because you're looking for a great deal. Um, and so it's expensive. But with games, like people are looking for deals, right? They're looking for something that's going to absorb a lot of their time so that they get a val- you know, value for you know time spent in some cases. Or they were like me as a kid with my record money, right? Like I, I mean, I had to choose between you know, Todd Rundgren and, you know, the Derudi column, you know, I have to like make a diff, you know, a difficult decision. Like which of these weird experimental records do I want to buy? I can't buy both. So like, yeah, you know, some people are like that. And it really does depend, I think, so much on where your players are. Like if you're pricing for Steam versus are you pricing for the console versus are you pricing for, you know, just like your own downloads on a PC, you know, web store or whatever. Sure. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I I think that I think the idea of the um like the race to the bottom is is a is a compelling one. I I mean, I don't think I don't think indie games can really there's not really like that much room for them to go <laughs> lower in price, right? So No. It's uh, you know, the games are indie games are between like 5 and uh $35 generally right so you're trying to basically decide like what what part of that that scale you should be in yeah unless you're the witness right yeah 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 <laughs> yeah I, I, no i mean i think it's i think it's cool for um i think it's cool for developers with stature to you know price higher to to try to like bump up the expectation cuz cuz there's there's a lot of expectation involved. Do you, did you feel like there was a lot of expectation around Splunky 2 and were you like were you thinking a lot about this because it was a sequel and you were like okay, I got to like I got to give the players something that they really feel is a value? Was that, that was that a big part of your thinking around that? Not really. I think with Splunky 2 more so, I just wanted to push what we had started with Splunky 1. I think um, definitely in terms of like the systems of Spelunky One, I just wanted to push it like as far as I I could go. Uh, just you know, like from like a theoretical point of view, like what is the possibility space of these rules that we've created for Spelunky One? And you yeah. know, always I think in terms of making games, you're also just talking about your own like physical and mental limits, right? Like I. I, I try to keep my game developments, you know, around three to four years for like a big project because, you know, by the time I get toward the end of the the three to four years, like I'm just, I, I kind of like mentally just can't, can't keep doing it, you know? Um, yeah, you get the fatigue. You get the fatigue. Yeah. And, and I think at, after a certain point, you start to get like marginal returns for, for the work that you keep doing, you know, at least for me personally, like I just, Oh yeah, no, I I totally agree. The number of times I've said this as a producer to people that are are winnowing down on some really small task and just can't let it go is, is probably, it's probably infinite at this point in my career. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and, and also it's just, I think after like a certain period of time, you know, you, you start to change as a person. And it can be hard, I think, to continue with a project that you started as like a completely different person. Like to me, that's a point where I, I want to start on a new project that represents who I who I am now, you know, compared to four years ago. Um, and I do kind of treat these games as like time capsules for for me and the team to to look back on um, flaws and all. You know, like I think I would rather put out a game that has has some flaws, you know, relative to who I, I am, who I was when I made it instead of just like continuously iterating on this one thing, like forever, because that's, that's what it will be like. Is like, you just keep doing it forever because you're, you're constantly evolving. So, you know, like I like to look, I like to look at back at my, my old games, including the ones I did when, 
Uh, I was in the click and play community. And it's, it's like a snapshot of who I was at that time. And yeah. it brings up like all these feelings, all these memories of who I was, who I was working with and what they were like. And uh, I think actually that time, that time limit of like a few years really helps make those memories about the project like a lot stronger, you know? Yeah. And probably a lot more positive. Like I've definitely been on productions that went really long and felt like at some point the game started to turn in on itself to the point that it had to almost change in order to keep going. Like that there was no way for it to stay in its current form. A little bit like when you're casting a pot and you pull it too high and it just starts to collapse in on itself, you know, like yeah, on a potting totally. wheel. It's just like the structural integrity of the game is no longer there. And I think it's in many ways, it's because people get burnt out. But it's also because if you, at some point, if you don't start to see the shape taking form, you can just start to feel like, oh, it's just going to collapse. Like you can almost will it in a way, if that makes sense. Just No, you, totally. I think I love the, I love the pot analogy because I, I actually think about the game's design as you know something that that hardens over time i think much like a you know a pot like baking in an oven or something like that where you know when you start out like the the vision or whatever you want to call it is just it's very soft it's very malleable and it can change a lot and then you know it starts to harden more and more and i think thinking about it that way helps me to like i you know like I said, I'm very visual, so I think I think I need to have that kind of visual and tactile analogy to help me get to a point where I can finish the game. Because it just certain things start to harden, and then I just I don't let myself like touch it because it feels like if I think about it like a pot or something like that, like once once it's hard, if I if I touch it, it's gonna crack or something like that. Yeah. So even it, even if it's like you know maybe kind of a quote unquote flaw, right? It's it sort of starts to become baked into the design. And to me, it becomes an interesting part of the design. Yeah, it's character. It's like wabi sabi. There's like if you're working on a watercolor, the the perfect analogy would be that like you do a wash and you have kind of an idea for how you want the shading on, say, the sky to look, or like you want the sunlight on these trees to look. And so you like fill in the areas that are lightest and then you start to go over them with dark. And if you don't have patience, you don't wait, then you might have some dampness in the paper in an area that you want to stay light and then the darker contrast will bleed into it. But if you're lucky, you can kind of adjust your flow in the moment to make that bleed something that feels like a little bit abstract, artistic kind of look in the paper itself. But if you don't like it and you try to go over it with a finer line later, it can end up looking really muddy because you put so much pigment on the paper that it just mutes out any kind of a, any of the light that would be coming through the texture of the paper, the transparency of the paper and so forth. And you can always tell when a watercolor has been overworked because it just looks muddy and like hard in places that it shouldn't. So it's it's so important not to overwork it because you essentially crack the 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 sort of the, the what works about the physics of watercolor on paper by overworking it. And I I definitely think that games can get that way, especially if they have too many systems. If people add content systems a lot of times, they add like three or four extra content systems on top of like a village sim or whatever, you know? And it's just like, you didn't need all this stuff. Like, it's just a lot of, now I got to worry about all these other things. I don't want to worry about this. I just wanted to like, you know, for example, you know, like the townscaper, I just want to drop some stuff down and like have a good time. <laughs> townscaper probably could have had a lot more features if, if they had kept going, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think it's, I think it's really important. I think, yeah, watercolor for sure. Like after a certain point, you know, your paper is just going to it's just going to like come apart. It's like, it's like the ultimate, like no, no take backs way of painting. And, you know, I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of anxiety in, in having unlimited undos basically, you know, like 
we have we do have all this technology that just makes it very easy to to undo redo and um i think yeah i i think it 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 causes a lot of uh a lot of unnecessary stress and i think about the process of making games a lot because it's so it's so key to you know being able to like finish games finish projects and and move on um and so I, I think about it a lot. I think about you know all kinds of like techniques and stuff that that I use to try to to help me get to that point. What are and, some of uh, your strategies for like disciplining yourself against unnecessary changes or rework? Well, you know, I like for me, I try to I try to go into a project like actually feeling like I understand it like quite well and being able to visualize it. Mm-hmm you know, feel like I can visualize it, it, it sort of totally sort of, you know, with the understanding that I'm, I I don't understand it as well as I do. You know, I think there's, it's kind of like the, um, it's kind of like, you know, doubling like your, your estimate for, for how long a project is going to take. Like there's how much you think it's going to take in the beginning. And then there's how much it actually takes. And, you know, the more games you make, the more, you realize how true that is that it always takes it always takes longer and so for me i i also now realize that i could feel like i understand this game like 100% and then by the time i'm done i realized i really only understood like 50% of it when i went into it <laughs> yeah it's kind of like adding that padding for my for my understanding um and you know that's that's i think a personal thing i think i think a lot of people like the ideas they want to they want to make they want to like go in with sort of like a vague idea of what they want. And then they just want to wrestle like with the idea a lot. Um, Yeah. There are people that do really enjoy this like process of having something to obsess about and to look at from a variety of angles for a really long time. It's almost like the difference between say like a philosopher who wants to just like argue about the, the potential space of say like a moral choice or whatever and someone who's like a sociologist that wants to observe some people and then like write a paper about it and then make some kind of an impact, you know, on on a community or on a, in society, you know, like I want to study the way that people react to certain kinds of advertising about medication for AIDS so that I can improve the way that we message this so that we can save more lives, right? Like that's a very different sort of engagement than someone who's like you know, what is the obligation of a society to to prevent people from doing risky behaviors, you know? But it does right. feel like there's, there, there is a real spectrum in game development between people that are like, I want to get this thing done and out there into the hands of players and people who are like, I'm really interested in the conceptual implications of the art form itself. For sure. I mean, for me, it's just like making games is, it's just, it's such a long and complex process and it's it's intimidating and i think it just it makes me feel better to kind of approach it with this very i guess like pragmatic point of view plus i think just you know i think seeing um like new game developers struggle with this stuff like i i'm very i'm like inspired to want to tell them to i think think about it more as as like a craft to start like something with with these very sort of tangible skills involved in, in actually just finishing, you know, and I think like we, everyone starts by, um, or everybody, all the like experienced game developers, it seems like suggest that, that new developers start with like small projects, right? Like yeah. start small, finish, get like, learn what the entire process of making a game is as quickly as possible, because you need to see like, what's coming in the second half of development. You need to feel what it's like to to release a game, you know, because I think it's so, it's so difficult if you, if you don't know what that end part of making a game looks like, it's so easy to just get stuck kind of in the beginning over and over again. And that was something that, you know, I, I, it's another reason why I feel very grateful for the click and play community because we, we did have that chance to learn that I think in a, in a place where, the the expectation was not that you know you've got to make like like a really big like i don't know 
epic Metroidvania <laughs> game or something like that, or like yeah. an RPG or something like that. You know, um, the the expectations I think were more more geared to toward be- beginners, and I think you know, hopefully, like Roblox is sort of like feels the same way for the the kids that are making stuff in that. It's like I don't need to make you know like the like a triple A level thing, or even unless it's just like a big indie game, a big like I. I don't need to make like even Spelunky 2, right? Like I can just make like a very, very small, fun thing to play with my friends because if you can kind of like trick yourself into just finishing like a small thing that way, you'll gain so much knowledge and confidence that that will help you in the future. I love the pot analogy. I love talking about watercolor and stuff like that because it's like, to me, I very much think about game development as kind of a craft like like yeah. those things too you know yeah it's funny if you think about like sewing is another one that is a really good analogy because sewing you have to buy a sewing machine and then you have to buy a pattern and then you need to learn how to cut fabric and put it together in a certain order so that all the seams are facing the right way when you put it on and essentially you're you're building a 2d model um, out of pieces and then you're stitching it together and then you're turning it into a 3D model that you will wear. And that's, you know, the the act of sewing a dress, for example, can be done in many, many, many ways. And the more complicated it is, usually the more expensive the dress is. <laughs> um, but like a very basic dress is essentially, you know, two pieces sewn together that each look like one side of a dress, like a gingerbread man dress in a dress. It's just, it's a t-shirt that stops long, you know, and you can, you can just make a dress like that. But even the act of making a dress like that, you have to sew it inside out and then turn it right side out and put it on. And the moment that you do that, like I, I started sewing when I was a kid for my dolls in my dollhouse. My grandmother taught me how to make little dresses that were basically little baby t-shirts. Um, the, the miracle of turning a shape from the inside to the outside and seeing that it fit as a dress was super cool to me. And later when I got really into origami, I realized that like origami is the art of designing two-dimensional shapes into three-dimensional shapes by just folding paper, which is like, it's a really interesting process once you get into it. But if you look at origami and you're like, I'm going to fold that like, you know, 3,000 fold dragon or like beetle or whatever, and that becomes your your goal when you start, you're just, you're done for. Like you'll never have the patience. You have to start with a paper crane or a box or, you know, a really basic dinosaur or a bird or something. And then you just have to practice a lot, right? But somehow I think games... There's this weird thing where we're just like, yeah, it'll be my first game, but it'll be a full, like you said, a fully functional RPG with like a massive story. Well, I think the things you're you're talking about, like sewing and origami, and you know, we talked about watercolor and and like sculpting a, a pot or something like that. There's there's a physical connection and a physical limitation to it, and so it it just feels like it has a natural end, whereas game development. I think can very easily feel like there's just actually no end to it. And I, you know, games as, as a art form also, it's just, you can play a game forever too. Right. So it's like really, yeah, it's really limitless. And that limitlessness, I think, you know, seeps into the, the process of making it where you can kind of feel like as a developer that I could just keep working on this game forever. And some people do, right. You know, like, Dwarf Fortress, for example. Exactly, yeah. Tarn has said he's going to be working on that game for his entire life. Yeah. You know, which I, I think is awesome. Like, he's, he, he wants that. He's committed to that. But I think, like, every developer who is not, you know, even the ones who are not trying to do that, the ones who are just trying to spend, like, six months, a few years making a game and releasing it, I think are still pulled into the project in that same way because of the sort of limitless potential of video games, which is what's, what makes them so cool, but also what makes them so difficult. So I think I think what we're talking about here is, you know, for me, I think I've, I've actually talking to you, I've realized that I, I kind of think about, I, I try to think about making a game in like a physical way that it sort of yeah. is not just to like give myself those built in natural physical limitations and endpoints to to just get me to like put the game out i i think about the game yeah in terms of like 
soft and hard. And I think about it in terms of like a time capsule for, for my like, you know, physical, <laughs> like aging process and stuff. And yeah. I, I've actually have never, you know, like thought about it, uh, thought about why I think about it in, in those terms. But, you know, talking to you, I'm realizing it's like, it's because it's physical. It's like I'm imposing a physical thing on on a non-physical limitless process and, and art form. So that's actually kind of cool. You know, it's funny because I think about games like yours or like Noita, um, games that have like a lot of simulation in them and a, a lot of deep thinking about systems and the ways that they interact and that, that are generative in some way. Um, you know, I'm, I'm been working on some generative narrative systems and some of the stuff that we're making currently. And also thinking a lot about this, the ecosystem of Roblox as it of itself, a, a generative system. And I'm, I'm fascinated by those things because my background is in AI, but I felt that same way in many, in many ways, like about my thesis and the work that I was doing as a grad student. At some point it just felt like, wow, I could talk and think about dynamic difficulty adjustment systems and the ways that you could write algorithms to moderate a game's flow for literally the rest of my life. And I could spend my whole life being the game adjustment lady, <laughs> you know, like that's all I do is talk about DDA. And like, I could build a bunch of different prototypes of this specific kind of system that I was working on. I had all these different kinds of game ideas around DDA. And then at some point I just, I honestly was like, if I did that, I might go nuts. Like I might actually lose myself in the process of programming. And I actually, I've, I've said this to people in the past, like I, when I am obsessed with something, I get obsessed with it to the point that I don't, I don't feel compelled, I don't feel compelled to do much else um, in the moment. So I, I'm, I'm OCD and that I will, like, if I move into a new apartment, I will spend every hour of the waking day until every single object that I move into that space is in exactly the place that I want to be in, for example. And I just can't stop. Like I just, I get to the point where if I'm, if it's not perfect, it, it, it makes me feel like I can't sleep. And programming, definitely, there's a part of me that loves programming, but there's a bigger part of me that is like, if I don't get outside every day and like actually pet my dog and like think about people, I will, I will never leave my home. You know, I will never get away from the computer. And I, and in, in some ways, I think I chose a career in design production and then eventually running a business to avoid that part of it. And I think you're right. It is. It's the endlessness of it for me leads to a feeling of like, oh, well, it has to be perfect. I mean, if, if I can keep shaping it until it's perfect, then I should, because why would you turn out anything less than perfect? And it, really, that's kind of a, it's a very dangerous attitude for someone like me, I guess is what I would say. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I totally. The path of despair. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally identify with that. And I think, I think it's a problem with making games and you have to, you have to impose these limits to um to be able to to make games in a healthy way because yeah i don't know it's it's tough it's what makes games like so compelling is kind of the the limitless limitless potential of them um and just like creating like alternate realities right like yeah totally you know, it's it's you're, you it's an infinite number of of alternate realities that that you can create and interact with and live in um you know i'm sure i'm sure a lot of these kids in roblox could just live in roblox like if they could uh if they could you know they do i mean i actually think it's i think it's a really interesting thing to think about what happens when someone has been in a community like the one that you were in or one like roblox or whatever becomes the next roblox whenever that eventually dawns on us you know maybe it's a vr place what are the what are the, what is the nature of a, of a person who grows up in a world that is constrained but unconstrained in those ways i mean i think some of my favorite science fiction is about the nature of of a reality when reality can be modified in real time by like nanomatter or whatever, right? Like if you live in a world where everyone is constantly able to imagine things and they become real, like what does it mean to fall off the cliff? You know, if you've never really fallen from a cliff and you do it simulated a bunch of times and then actually you do, you know, do you even have fear before you die? Like there's, there's some really interesting questions about the nature of like your perception of reality as it, 
is it comes from what you build. And I, I guess that's one of the reasons why I like making games that are really cheerful or like wholesome, I guess, in a way, because I feel like it's important to give people the opportunity to spend time in a wholesome environment where they are engaging with characters or mechanics that are interesting, but that like, it, I feel like it has an impact, you know, like if you play a lot of Spelunky, you start thinking about systems and like, you know, you get into that space where you're just like, okay, I've got to, I've got to figure out how to do this one thing. So I'm going to try these other things and, oh, that didn't work. And it, it puts you in the mind of being very procedural about your actions. Um, and then I think it infects the way you think about other things in a positive way. You start to think about the systems behind things. No, yeah, I think about games like like their like their food, like their nutrition, and you yeah. need a variety, just like you need a variety of food. Again, it's like, yeah, I'm really realizing like I'm just I impose a lot of kind of like physical constraints and and use a lot of like physical analogies when I think about games because I think it's just it's necessary to to interact with and make games in a healthy way. Um, and yeah, you know, just like. Speaking of speaking of your games, like you know, I was playing with Tom yesterday with with um, my daughter, and uh, yeah, she was so it was great. Like it was, she was just giggling and uh, just having a, a great time. And you know, it was, was kind of interesting. I think it's always interesting to actually to see sort of the way she interacts with with this stuff versus like me and her mom, you know. And I think there's like a very we can see that we have like as as grown-ups we have a very instinctive sort of nature to like find goals and everything you know and like progress um and and she just doesn't have that that same kind of uh feeling yet which is i think and i think playing you know games like like with tom is a great way to sort of yeah, I think, uh, you know, give her like a more well-rounded sort of way of, of thinking about stuff instead of this like, yeah, you know, continuous, like I need to make progress, I need to be productive, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, this is, I think, I mean, I can't speak for Kato, you know, because it's really like that game came from inside of him. But I think a lot of what he was trying to get at was the process of having kids and realizing how goalless and directionless kids are and how perfect that is. And, you know, there were definitely d discussions on the development side around, you know, well, why doesn't it have a tutorial or why doesn't it do this or why doesn't it do that? Or like, how will you know what to do? That was a common question that would come up a lot in review. Like, how will players know what to do? And I think his answer was always, who cares? Like, they can figure it out, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, uh, like, how do you know what to do when you're five? You just like keep doing stuff and sometimes it hurts and sometimes it's fun and then sometimes you do it and you know, you do it because you're told to do it because you don't want to get in trouble. But like, why, why does the game have to be like that? Why does it have to be like your parents telling you to eat your vegetables? Like, can't it just be like going outside? Yeah. I love, I love that Kata can say that. I, I try to act tough and say that kind of stuff all the time. Like who cares? <laughs> and then I'm always like, all right, fine. Yeah. You know, we need to like make it a good user experience or, <laughs> or whatever. We don't really get too frustrated. So I, uh, I love that uh, that Kata can can just say that. There's a, there's a lot of I see all kinds of parallels too between just parenting and and being a game developer. Um, in, in the sense that you know I think in in both cases you're trying to like design like a really great experience that you know has some challenges in it, but also just a lot of room for creativity and and growth and learning. And eventually, you know, you want the the kid or the player to be like an, an independent individual, but I, and I, I learn a lot from my from my daughter too, and I think yes, particularly watching her play games like with Tom or like Animal Crossing, um, and just see how see how she interacts with it, and um, it, I think that goallessness is is it's a great thing that I I think like as adults we need to, you know, it's like very healthy for adults to to be able to see that and see how, how important it is. Um, it's for, funny for actually. And then for us to. You're kind of talking about two ends of the same thing, right? It's like, we're talking about like at the beginning of the process of making a game, you want to really engage with that sense of play and investigation and curiosity, because that's really where great game ideas come from. The rawness, you know, we were talking about earlier on. And then, 
as you get closer to the end, you really need to sort of see it as a physical process that that involves time, your life, and your sanity. <laughs> like, you know, there is this like it's kind of like you almost are on a seesaw where you want you want to start off on the one side and then you want to cross over and get to the other side, right? You know, you need to sort of balance the freedom and the creativity and the formlessness at the beginning so you find something interesting. But once you, like you said, once you see it, once you understand it, you really do have to give yourself a limited amount of time to make it into the shape it's going to be. Like, otherwise you'll just ninny it until kingdom come, basically. Yeah, I think it's a real challenge with making games where you have to be like so many different people at different times. I think especially as an indie where you're wearing a lot of different hats. And, you know, at one point you may try to be like, honestly, more of like a child or like a, like an, you know, an amateur, someone who back, I try to, you know, bring myself back to when I was in the click and play community and like just really free. But then, you know, I need to like transition to being a professional who needs to like polish the experience a bit. And then, yeah, when I'm, when I'm like marketing the game, I'm like a different you know, a different type of person. And when I'm getting feedback, I'm different because I need to be a little less sensitive when I'm getting feedback because if I'm like the very sensitive kind of creative artist, then the yeah, feedback, the a lot of feedback is just too painful to, yeah. to process, right? So I've got to be kind of like the the steely sort of, you know, robot just just parsing the feedback and stuff like that. And so it is definitely like a very like emotionally draining process I think a fun one too, but yeah, it can be difficult for sure. I think it's what you're talking about is the artist's way. You know, it's just the, the way in which you have to conceive of, fall in love with, you know, really work with and then let go of the work, you know, and it could be in, in the way you were saying, like, you know, a, a game isn't a sculpture or a painting, but in a way it is. <laughs> and, and you really do need to sort of have the same process, even if the the ecosystems in which games are distributed and the way that people engage with the content and the pricing and all these things, even though those things kind of do make them make it feel like more of a commodity or, you know, or of a, like a produced good than a piece of art. That's just the nature of its ability to be transformed, you know, into bits and sent across a telephone line or a wire, you know, like the, the reality is, is that it is a crafted thing that you made. And so you have to engage the artist's way while making it. And then you have to really see it as a product once it's done, if you decide that you, you know, you want to sell it that way. And I guess the real, the real difference between some, you know, some developers and others would be, yeah, where on the spectrum they fall of wanting to be seen as a piece of art, you know, versus, versus a commodity and what is their level of participation in the creation of that product? It's a really, it's a really interesting time to be a game developer because there are so many different kinds of game developers out there, you know? For sure, yeah. And I mean, I just really, I want like every type to be able to find the kind of success they're looking for. Um, yeah. And I think that's, yeah, it's always a challenge, you know, with an with an industry, I think, to it's a, it's a, like the most worthwhile challenge, but it is a challenge to try to make that happen, you know? Yeah, it really is. I am just so thrilled that we got to catch up. It's been too long. I have not seen another indie developer face-to-face for almost nine months now. <laughs> yeah. But it was, it's just really great to get a chance to chat with you and, and, and hear a little bit about your process and also just think about it out loud. It was really fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. As you know, as usual, I, I, always learn a lot about myself talking with other game developers yeah. about making games too. So. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us for the Game Maker's Notebook. For more information on the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, our podcasts and our other initiatives, please visit www.interactive.org.